Hey, 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 we should be live here. And uh, as you can see, I am joined by Alex Barnes Ross, apostate Alex from the UK. Hi. Excellent. Okay, good. Looks like we're all good. Uh, greetings from the coast of Northern California. Hey, Stuart. <laughs> okay, good. We are live. We're having ourselves a live stream today. I'm sure um, the, oh, uh, let me, let me, let me correct. No, no, that should be good. It should be good. It should be coming on here in a second on the chat down there below. Um, but we're going to be spending most of the day today um, not here with the chat. I don't know if it's going to come on or not. I'm a little surprised it hasn't yet, but we'll see. But this show is a little tongue in cheek this uh, today. We're doing this little kind of fun midweek live stream. And I've asked Alex to join me for this because just last week, a film made by L. Ron Hubbard back in the 1960s at St. Hill in the UK, the uh, St. Hill Manor, which is where Hubbard decided to take up residence back in 1959, 1960, and set up the International Hub of Scientology there. And he was bringing people from all over the world to do training at this location as well. It wasn't just his home. And he made, ah, there we go. There's the chat coming on. And uh, he, and Stuart, the film is about half an hour and we'll see how many interruptions we have as we go through it. Um, so this film um, was created as a promotional piece to send around to the Scientology churches around the world and promote Scientology and this place and L. Ron Hubbard's home and this kind of thing. So I've never seen it. You're in for a treat. I, so I've heard. <laughs> so I've heard. And um, I have not seen it. Let me tell you quickly why because it's not like this was sitting around at the orgs to watch this this was not an available property to see um as i remember it it was actually only available to watch if you were doing the saint hill special briefing course uh, at asho um or at a saint hill had you ever seen it nope first time i saw it was when tony ortega sent it to me and he said, hey, dude, this is just surfaced and I want to do an article about it. I'd love for your opinions and thoughts on it. So he sent me the link. I watched it um, and gave my comments. And then he published the article the next day. But I didn't even know it existed at all. Right. OK, cool. And I had heard about it um, really once or twice, three times, maybe somebody referenced it. It was not an important life-changing, oh my God, you have to see this film. That's not how Scientologists thought about this thing at all. Most of them, I don't think, have seen it. Um, and from what I understand, that's probably a good thing because I, I, I think Hubbard doesn't come off quite so well. I've, I've, I've literally only watched like the first 10 seconds because just to set it up on my, on my OBS here. But we're going to go through the whole thing and uh, hopefully this all plays smoothly. So I guess with that intro, uh, we should just get to it. This is, uh, I, I, yeah. I don't usually do reaction videos, but I thought this will be fun. Let's do it. Yeah. And just to note for everyone um, in the live chat, the way we've got it set up. So I have to watch the video on YouTube here on my second screen. So there's a little bit of a delay. I think it's about four seconds at the moment. So that we might have a few challenges with that, but you know. We'll get there. Be fine. It's true enough. We we might have that, and we'll we'll roll with it. I've got it set on the lowest latency for the video, so hopefully we won't have too many lags here. Let's go ahead and flip over to the screen I have prepared for us. And uh, this is pretty rough. This film. I mean, from what I saw from the beginning, this is old. Uh, so that, it was almost handmade productions. Yeah, 1963, I think it was. And just off the get-go, before we get started, yeah. I think it's really important to note, I'm pretty sure it says it in the opening titles, that this was directed, filmed, everything by L. Ron Hubbard himself. So this is, considering Source is meant to be the best and most important person, and you know he does things absolutely correctly and perfect without any problems or hiccups, um, from the get-go, it's just a badly made film. Um, and it's got his name on it. He's proud of it. And, you know, the opening sequence sequence says like a waterfall or something in the background. The audio is really rubbish. And it's just funny that, you know, LRH is meant to be the best at everything. And then there's this really bad film. 
<laughs> it's that really, AC's. it's yeah. I, I mean, I'm that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, let's go ahead and hit play and make sure everybody can hear this and everything. Here we go. Welcome to St. Hill. <laughs> this is the home of HCO Worldwide. This is where all your books, your tapes, all your bulletins come from. This is the home of the St. Hill Special Briefing Course. And this is where we have the Worldwide Dissemination Center of Scientology. Now, I'm just going to say right off in terms of reaction here, I'm watching this man stand there blinking, stuttering, you know, sort of heart tr struggling to remember what he's supposed to say. He's clearly got a script he's trying to run. And this is uh, clear. This is an OT. This is a man who claims to have perfect recall of billions of years of memories, but he can't remember something he wrote down an hour ago, right? For me, it's the stance, <laughs> like the, the one right. leg up, the... Yeah. Hey guys, yeah. like that's why, why is he standing like that? Like, oh, hi, my rugged American. Uh, you know, I don't know. And that jacket with that little HCO patch on it and the, and the ascot, the, the, it's, it's the ascot that really makes the man when it comes to Hubbard. I've, I always thought, I'm just going to say it. I always thought that looked foolish. I always <laughs> thought that looked like, what is that? You know? Yeah. All right, so yeah, here he is introducing his home. So let's carry on here. This is also my home. Do you like it? I hope you do. But right now, I want to show you some new technology which we have, some new techniques of one kind or another, and how this technology is going to be brought to you on film in order to make better auditory, more clear, and more OT. Now, that was actually a pretty significant and important statement in 1963 because Hubbard had been sending around lectures and reproducing lectures in mass quantities um, for years throughout the Scientology network, but they had only once or twice tried to do film. There's the Clearing Congress that they did, which they later colorized. It was black and white when back in the day. And that also was a really interesting view of Hubbard. Those Clearing Congress films, if you all haven't seen those things, man, will you get an up close and personal of what Hubbard looks like when he's actually lecturing. Um, but this one here is him announcing this. And this is the beginning of, you know, what Mark Headley always talks about with Mitch and stuff, all those technical training films and stuff. This is back when Hubbard first uh, conceived of that whole idea. He wanted to do it all here. Thank you. What's next here? Up oh, in the office. Welcome to the Congress. We're very glad you're here. Very glad that uh, you could come. We want to show you something about St. Hill. This, we see in front of you here, is my office. And uh, this is where all of your bulletins come from. I I'm always to be found around here writing up bulletins. You see the papers stacked up very often when I don't. See, the funny thing is he's referring to things we can't see that are out of frame. And he's repeating himself as well, because he just said that in the scene before. This is where your bulletins come from. Right. Yeah, this, <laughs> this script is, uh, this, this, this is some masterful editing here. <laughs> crafting, crafting this. Don't answer the mail. Why, uh, your letter lies in there for quite a while. Sometimes for years. <laughs> Hubbard, I, I think this was the time when Hubbard first started implementing having other people answer his his mail and stuff. I could be wrong about that. 
Um, but somewhere around this uh, round here is when, uh, yeah, he wasn't he wasn't answering those things. So so what he had com lag? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's, it's very serious com lag. So much so that late in later years they were they were chucking all of his letters off the side of the damn boat rather than answering them. You know. I wish they'd chucked his policies off the side of the boat instead. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, this office right here where he's sitting is actually, he would be in there until four or five in the morning sometimes. I mean, there were stories about this, writing policies or or typing them, or mostly, I think, writing because uh, he had a secretary pool by this point. It's like, go to bed, dude. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, he was, he was kind of nocturnal uh, yeah. in that way. Hubbard could get hyper-focused and... Um, uh, and when he did, he just powered through the night, you know, and that was how he would work. And then he'd sleep for like three straight days. <laughs> we are very, very busy here at St. Hill. We do a great many things. And uh... we have to rip people off. We have to charge them in exorbitant amounts of money for nothing at all. We have to lie, cheat and steal to them. Oh, so Such busy. Such a hard life. Oh, so busy. Oh, so busy. We have to keep right up all the time on the latest technology and so on. And all the instructors uh, we have here and staff we have here uh, are engaged in co-auditing. And they're making it. They're going right straight on through. And uh, the case levels are gaining um, all. Mm -hmm. Can I just say something? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... Considering, like you say, he's meant to be OT, no com lag, you know, tone 40 intention. He does say uh and um a lot. <laughs> For someone that's meant to be on the ball, like knows what he's going to say, know what's happening next. He's got a message. He's like, yeah, and then we uh, do this. And then uh, like, if you started like that around David Miscavige, you would have a tough time, I'd imagine. Oh, right there in that freeze frame is L. Ron Hubbard's pie face. <laughs> I don't normally laugh about that stuff, but sometimes you just got to use it, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Hubbard was, uh, and it's really interesting. It's so, so interesting to me, uh, just to comment on this uh, sort of semi-seriously, is how our views of this man change so radically when you are in and then when you have your wake-up moment and are like, oh, my God, and then everything suddenly looks different. And it's really something because I because I used to actually I mean, laughing now, I really used to think this dude was the super genius of this, uh, uh, yeah. uh, the, 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 the greatest super genius this planet had ever produced, you know? Yeah, uh, same. But now yeah. I look at him and think he looks like a fish. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's really something because all the flaws come out and you just mm. and you just can't see it when you're in. You just can't. It's just yeah. rose colored glasses 24 uh, seven. Precisely. All right. All the time, they're all winning. We uh, we have here too, of course, the St. Hill Special Briefing course. And this course has been in operation now for two and a half years. My personal course, I used to give HCCs, you know, and I found out that they didn't give enough latitude of training, and therefore we started running the St. Hill Special Briefing course, basically to provide expert instruction and auditing the various organizations in the world. Let me translate that for you. We would have people come twice a year to these advanced clinical courses where I would torture them for a few weeks at a time with my quote unquote latest techniques, but somehow the indoctrination didn't quite stick after they went home. So I thought I'd create a full-time place where people could come for a couple years really mess with their heads in such a way that it's sort of permanent and then send them on their way and not let them go until I'm satisfied that's where their head's at. Because that's pretty much what he just said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and by the way, this St. Hill Special Briefing Course, for those of you who don't know, because um, uh, this is kind of important, this course is Hubbard's brainchild and baby. This was the thing he was probably one of the most proud of in all of the Scientology canon it's everything it's all the books all the lectures all this stuff um, all those red books those big red volumes those are the course packs for this course you read all of that stuff and uh, it hasn't been being delivered in 20 years Miscavige shut it down 
Can't do it now. Yeah, you can't do it. Uh, and, and that alone, that alone would earn Miscavige 10 declare orders in a row from uh, L. Ron Hubbard. I, of that, I am so positive, I don't even have to think about it, you know? Anyway, just as a just as a point there, there's all these St. Hill orgs around the world, and there is no St. Hill Special Briefing Course anymore. Yeah. The St. Hill Special Briefing Course has been running now for two and a half years, and uh, we've been very successful in that period of time. Most of the technology is now stable, very, very stable. In actual fact, we have two courses running now, and you may have heard, of course, that the St. Hill Special Briefing Course keeps you forever. Well, actually, we have ended that now. We have uh, two courses, and uh, the 16 weeks hold. Somebody can come here and be trained for 16 weeks and go home, and he'll have his certificate. Won't necessarily be class, but he'll have his certificate. Yeah, that changed. <laughs> 16 weeks is not how long it takes to get through that class. Also, I don't want to get political, but he does, his manner of talking is very similar to Donald Trump. Like, he's mm. like, you know, it's bigger than ever, it's better than ever, and, you know, you never actually believe that, you know, well, actually, you know, the way he's talking is very Trumpite. No, you're not wrong. And in fact, I was going to, oh, thanks for those gifted memberships. Um I was um, going to point out the other thing he says here is it's all stable when he says that. That was actually a selling point back then because the first, you know, every year of Scientology, of Dianetics and Scientology was nothing but rolling out changes, constantly making, constantly changing, the, moving the goalposts and changing the actual fundamentals of the subject. He went from Dianetics to objectives to exteriorization to game theory to responsibility, all in the 1950s on top of other stuff. And, um, and then he starts the briefing course. And there is no bridge yet. There's no bridge to total freedom. There's no like orgs doing kind of what they're doing now. It was a very different, very wilder scene back then, <laughs> Scientologically. And people were, one of the reasons for the rotating door, you know, people coming in and leaving is because of all the changes and the, and the instability of it. And so Hubbard was always promising. This is where the, the, the promises come in. Always promising. This is it. We've got it. We found it. We nailed it. This is, this is, this is the thing. It's, it's planetary clearing from here on out. We've nailed it. We finalized it. It was 1963, right? Two years later, he's saying it again and keeping Scientology working. And then a year later, he's at a year and, a, and again and again. And it's the same uh, thing that Miscavige has to sell Scientologists on. It's, mm -hmm. it wasn't, it's not just a Miscavige thing that to repackage and reprint and do all this stuff, thing. right? It's, yeah. it's been there from the beginning. It's all stable. It's very stable. It's all it's very the stablest you've ever seen. So very, very stable. Oh yes, very, very stable indeed. Yes, very stable winds. Oh yes, carry on here. And then there's the upper level course that takes people to OT, and that is the second uh, activity. And it goes on up from there. And that course is about twenty weeks long. See, OT, just for anybody who doesn't know, because this is 1963, in case you're wondering, 67 is when OT3 comes out. But Hubbard had already figured out something called uh, the solo auditing, power processing, and the clearing course, and OT1 and OT2. And those were kind of the big kahunas, the big things to do for those years until 1967 when he went off and came out with the whole Xenu thing. So yeah, after it was chased out of the UK by the British government, that's mind you. That's right. That's exactly right. And lost the US tax exemption. <laughs> yeah. All hit him all at once. And he was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> so there is no longer any fear of being held on the course forever of not being certified where reason of the course in we've handled most of these things we have uh, had about 240 students through this course in the last two and a half years which is pretty good. And uh, most of these were classified, and uh, we uh -huh. do graduate them. And 240 students in two years. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. 
Yeah. And they were mostly staff members or really, really hardcore dedicated Scientologists. Because remember, they're traveling halfway around the world to, to go do this stuff. A lot of, maybe you guys don't know, but a lot of the orgs that exist now were started by people who went and did this class and went back to their areas. That's how uh, a ton of places started up. Seattle, I so know for sure. I just did the math, right? 240 yeah. students in two and a half years. That's just under two students a week. Yeah. And these are meant to be the golden days at St. Hill that is expanding and growth like we've never seen before. Oh, yeah. Tons of bodies there. But in terms of world impact, it's not even it doesn't even register on the on the, yeah. the counter. It's nothing, yeah. you know. All right. Oh, Ron. <laughs> there are eight graduating this week. We have uh, in the course the person who is course supervisor is uh, Mary Sue Hubbard and course secretary is Red Sharp and uh, I'd like oh, he to them by name. introduce them to you. This is Mary Sue, this is Mary Sue, and this is Red, and uh, Mary Sue usually takes care of all of the folders and uh, all of the various activities with regard to cases. She does a lot of things. And uh, these folders are uh, marked every day by somebody who is excellent in handling auditing, and people aren't permitted to go too far away on their cases. How are things going, Mary Sue? Very well. All right. Now, uh, Reg is the one who handles. I have never seen Mary Sue on video film on 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 film film i've only seen photos of her before this was the first time i've ever heard her voice yeah me too yeah wow and then red sharp i heard about reg in a in a multitude of lectures where ron name dropped him but i've never seen him before this will this is interesting uh, most of the Oh, I love that uh, focus, by the way. and their problems and that, that is sort some of thing. And he powerful cinematography he, going on here. By right the now. way, he is responsible for all this new television equipment we're going to show you a little bit later on. And uh, he handles these students very well. How's it going, Rich? Very well, indeed. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, well, now, while well, getting down here, here's a shot of the front of the manor. And here the students, some of the students coming out, going over to practical. Jenny Edmonds is there, one of the instructresses, with them. Well, here's a, a shot from the outside of the pavilion, and this is where the students learn their practical drills under the direction of Herbie Parkhouse, who is the uh, practical supervisor. Well, looking into the future, We've got the um, new buildings going up for our future students. This is the, will be the theory, and there we see the men. I'm just going to say, I, would, I wasn't aware that they had this much construction going on that early at St. Hill. Uh, this is just within the first few years of Hubbard being there, and that's, that's quite a lot of construction they got going on there. Well, yeah, think about it. So this was 1963. So he went to St. Hill. He, he bought the manor 1959. So he's been there four years at this point. And by 1966, he's gone. So, um, yeah, this is the start. It looks like that is the um, the castle, I think, by the look, because those oh. arches look like the um, where the course rooms are. Like there's a little kind of walkway alongside and there's these arches that looks like the the castle the beginning of that because that was finished in what 67 69 something like that oh yeah i, I see i'm not familiar with the construction on the site there as far as that goes here's what here's here's what i was told when i was in it's just as an anecdote uh somebody mentioned to me and i didn't even get the joke when they said it was uh somebody said oh yeah you can't in england you can't have any new properties built on a on a historic site yeah. or on a on a significant site or something unless it was already there and yeah you like you can't renovate unless it was already there to to renovate or something right yeah saint hill's in like an area of outstanding natural beauty so the 
um, restrictions on construction are a lot tighter than other parts of the UK. Um, and this is the story that they give you in Scientology. Whether or not it's completely true, I don't know. I, I have a feeling there's some elements of truth to it, but um, they needed to expand outside of the manor because there wasn't enough space. So that's why they built the castle. And the reason it's a castle is they wouldn't get planning permission for building this new building, but they found some antiquated law from hundreds of years ago that said something along the lines of you have a right to build a castle on your own land or something for defense against you know the Normans or whoever was invading at the time and so that's why they made it a castle um they didn't get planning permission for it and they uh, appealed it with this law and then they changed the law because of it uh because they didn't want people doing it but that's the story they give you I think there's an element of truth that they didn't have planning permission for it but that's why it's a castle yeah Okay, got it. Got it. Yeah, what I was told was uh, was simply that Hubbard's solution to the problem of uh, there not being any pre-existing structure there was to literally pick up a rock, roll it over to where he wanted to build, and goes, well, it looks like a castle to me. <laughs> right, and that was the cute anecdote for how Hubbard yeah. sidestepped the entire bureaucracy of the, you know, of the, of the evil WOGS. <laughs> I don't even want to say that word <laughs> yeah. anymore. Uh, okay, let us carry on here. But this is interesting. I did. I just didn't know that construction. I thought this construction all happened much later. So this is very interesting to me. Working on the new building, and here's a, another shot of the manor, and including a bit of the swimming pool. Yeah. Here so we that, have just so people yeah. get a bit of reference. That well, it's paused now on the second shot, but the shot we saw just before, yeah. where it's looking at the manor that's from if you're at the castle and you're walking down towards the manor that's kind of at the end of where the the castle is looking towards the manor um it's interesting to see all of this stuff like back in the day and how it hasn't changed at all like it's all been kept like a time capsule interesting interesting a shot of the chapel and the uh, pavilion and there we see a student just walking up and she's going to throw fed in a wishing well Right, and here we have a, an interior view of the pavilion. Here's wow, a shot I've of seen the so many. Of the I've seen so many photos when I was in Scientology of Hubbard supervising students or people milling about in these locations, but I never had sort of a 3D view of like where these things were and located to one another. And they're tiny as well, like in person, like the this the Saint Hill Special Briefing Course room and the chapel and like all of these different places in person they're tiny little buildings the right. castle is massive the manor is massive but in person it's quite underwhelming when you think about this is meant to be the huge packed out saint hill with so many people that there's no space well there's no space because they're tiny little buildings and this here is the saint hill special briefing course you're led to believe that there's hundreds of students but you can see there's like what 20 30 people Re exactly and because they use such tiny little spaces and camera angles and stuff you get these weird yeah. weird images of it which is you know again par for the course today too so kind of kind of fits you know and now this building isn't used for anything it's just empty really like, it's a sh it's a shrine yeah <sighs> wow of like course. same with the manor the manor is yeah. a shrine like you go right. there and you can go for tours and stuff but it's treated in the same way that the office of lrh is kept in orgs it's like this is LRH's space, you know, same with these buildings. There's a separate building for the Purif and everything else is done in the castle now. These buildings are kept just like a museum now. I got it. Okay. I, okay. I wondered, I thought there was still some work done in the manor and stuff. So thank you for, thanks for clarifying that for me. I, um, I think your word, I think your use of the word shrine is more yeah. accurate than you, than you, than you yeah. may, may. It's, that's that's exactly that's a very fitting yeah. word no work gets done in the manor the manor is staffed by one person who's the lrh com or whatever and it's just for tours it's just like nothing it all happens in the castle or at clo which is over the road right 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 as they're mentioning in the comments this definitely looks like 1930s films uh, going on here yeah. all right let's let's carry on and Mary Sue is giving away certificates for uh, graduation. A number of students are graduating today. And uh, graduation. Social proof. 
Everybody applaud. Um, you. Oh, there was a shot of the uh, TV screen which we use in the chapel. Here we are in the uh, TV control room. You now look at the picture of the camera, which is actually taking the picture that you are looking at now. And here is a picture of the screen that it's coming off of. In the last picture. Wow. You know, it's interesting, just that point of the 1930s and the quality of this film. Uh, Scientology, it's not just a miscavige thing that they've been running 10, 20 years behind everybody else in terms of tech. I mean, you know, Hubbard was always like, like in his writings, you would think if you only read Hubbard's writings as a staff member, you would think that St. Hill and back in the day, Hubbard was on the cutting edge of technology. The telex machine was cutting edge. The, the, the typewriters and stuff they were using was all cutting edge. And then you look at the products they produce and the curtains that are hanging up and those flowers and this, and this, this, sh this, this sort of sh shabby sort of appearance and, and presentation. And you're like, this is the best you could do in, I mean, 1963, they could do a lot better than this, you know? Well, I'm sure it's similar to SMP, Scientology Media Productions. You know, Rachel Hastings has said before, and Mitch Brisker, that they've got all of this multi-million dollar, you know, TV, film, camera equipment that nobody knows how to use because it's important to have the latest and greatest tech, right. but they don't know how to use it. And I think it's the same here. Like they are probably using, you're, they're not wrong in using, you know, the greatest cameras and all of this fantastic, you know, forward thinking technology, TV screens in the sixties were not hugely right. popular. So like they probably were at the cutting edge, but they they didn't know how to use it or what they didn't have the, the knowledge behind it, the expertise. No, it's, and it's really shows. I mean, it's stark. It's in your face. It's not, I mean, yeah. this is out of focus. It's not like <laughs> this is, you know, this is, these are primitive mistakes. I would, I would be, a, yeah. I, I would have been, I would have reshot the whole thing rather than send this out. You know, it's not like they, they were on some schedule or, or there was some target they had to meet to get this out. This is Hubbard's little baby. So this yeah. is what he's sending out as, yes, this is how I want the world to see us. <laughs> you know? Wow. I mean, this is in the same time the Beatles are hitting. Uh, there, there's, I mean, there's, there's a tremendous amount of technology and, and a wealth of ways to get your name out there in 1963. And this is how he chooses to do it as an OT mastermind. I, it's really revealing. <laughs> wow. All right, let's carry on here which you saw, you saw a motion picture camera regulated to 25 frames a second pointed at the face of a TV set. This picture actually is the picture which that camera is taking at this moment. I am now in the upstairs studio at St. Hill Manor okay. and the camera is down in the basement and we have various communication lines which go through such as this is where they got creative. This is where they got creative. Pointing a film camera at a TV screen of a of a thing in order to be able to record, right? Yeah, but I just don't get why. Like, why don't they just put a camera in front of him? Why do they have to create all this dev T, to use a Scientology term, and film a TV screen in a different route? Like, well, they couldn't what, video why? the TV screens, right? <laughs> they could do a closed caption TV video, but what they were trying to do was that was set up look in. This is the this is the birth of the auditing look-in system right that's what they were doing and the only way they had to record was audio tape um and uh those were big right so they didn't have cassettes yet so they only had reel to reel and they could stick a microphone on somebody or put a microphone on the desk um but when it came to filming and seeing what was happening in the session they only had film and so they had to stick a camera in front of a TV. I'm only mentioning it's like, it's a creative problem solving kind of way to go about it. Clearly Red Sharp figured this out, not Hubbard. But it's, but at, you gotta remember at the time, this is, they can do that? You know, like it, this yeah. would have been really impressive to some people in 63, you know, filming auditing sessions. Cause this wasn't just for Hubbard. This was for all the students who were, who were learning how to audit there. They desperately wanted to have a video review line. 
putting all of your money to good work. That's right. That's right. That's what this is. The microphone and uh, other TV uh, equipment uh, connected up here, which relays down there. We have a, a signal system which goes down. And uh, That's subtle. we have these various rigs, one kind or another. From here, actually, a line goes out to the chapel, which you've already seen a picture of, and students can see out there. But quite in addition to that, we can take motion pictures of all these programs. The sound that you hear at this particular moment is not particularly good because it is a microphone copy of a plain, ordinary TV speaker. Well, the now, sound know, is a lot better than the picture. Temporary rig just the to show you what is happening. Also not, yeah. I think that's the problem here. Uh, um, it does yeah, not like, matter not the microphone, the content. What I the other, the other thing Hubbard was, the other problem Hubbard was solving here, by the way, for just for for people to, to know, is he was also doing a lot of um, auditing demonstrations of different procedures and and techniques and stuff. And if you do that sort of thing live in front of people, and you're trying to give an actual auditing session, there was always a distraction factor uh, with the person who was holding the cans, and you would get all kinds of interesting reactions on the needle and stuff just because of the fact that you know you got. 40 people watching you as you're, you know, being grilled on an e-meter by L. Ron Hubbard, right? So they wanted to set up a system so that he could audit somebody out of sight of all that and still be an auditing demonstration, too. That was also part of this. I research or develop the tremendous amount of time, the thousands and thousands of hours which have gone into research in Scientology have brought forward a great deal of information. It does not much matter... I love the way he just just drops casually the thousands and thousands of hours of development of Scientology. <laughs> no, man. <laughs> Come on. Stop it with that. Just stop it. Yeah. There have not been thousands. What happens with this information, uh, if it cannot be relayed or taught, in other words, the information is valueless unless it can be communicated. The formulation of communications in Scientology is one of the most vital steps which we have undertaken. And uh, you get Scientologies, which some of you complain about, but that is because things have been developed which have no name in the English language. But education English, right? consists of a relay of an idea or a fact or a datum to another mind, to another being. And the communication means are quite as important as communication itself. We have, therefore, several techniques here which uh, we use. One of those things is just straight lecture or straight talk, such as I'm giving to you right this moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, you that? know that reinterpreted lectures are seldom as effective and actually add confusion. So a straight lecture, such as you're getting at this particular moment on this subject, is very beneficial to the uh, general uh, uh, relay of the information which you want. So much com lag for an OT. What did he just say? What was that? I totally lost it in that lag. So much word salad. Oh, so much word salad going on right now. But there are other means of doing this. There is graphic uh, representation by mm -hmm. means of a graph. You see over here, here is a graph board, which you're going to oh, see a picture of love in this a moment. Chris. He loves graphic there representation. There is three-dimensional graphic representation, which yes. is a very interesting yes. field of visual education. Oh, yes. And there's also demonstrations such as a, an auditing session. And all of these things add up to educational means and media. Scientology, to some degree, has lacked this tremendous communication, and uh, therefore its results have been impeded to that degree. But we have all this equipment now, and we are making this effort at this particular time. And now that we have arrived, you might say, at all levels of Scientology, we do need this in order to bring to you and to students of Scientology a totality of effectiveness of Scientology. Now I'm going to show you just some brief glimpses 
of the type of educational media which will be used on film and uh, uh, over TV closed circuits in order to educate people into the effectiveness of Scientology. Oh my god. So I mean, it's, this is, he, uh-huh. he didn't make sense though. He said this is the type of media that is going to be used on film that is going to be used to educate people. Like he's not thinking straight. <laughs> Well, yeah, fair enough. I think, I mean, it's L. Ron Hubbard, right? I, yeah. I was going to comment, <laughs> I was going to comment on the fact that he's trying to solve a problem in education is as he's sitting here word salading away, he could have just said, look, we want to show it to you. So we're going to put it on film. You know, I mean, that, if he had just cut to the chase, right? Um, basically, that's what he was saying there. But I, I was more taken with the fact that OT3 hadn't yet even come out yet, right? He doesn't even know that's coming in the future. And he's telling people straight up, we're done. We finished. We got it all. We got it all worked out. Here it is. Now we're going to figure out how to communicate it. And what I was going to mention here is there are traces here of, again, the beginnings of, of what became ASI or a, not a, ASI author services is literary guys, but uh, CST, the Church of Spiritual Technology, the vaults, saving everything, right, keeping everything. Like this is the part where you look at L. Ron Hubbard and how he and how he spent his money and what he did with his time, and you think to yourself, Nah, this wasn't just some con in his head. This was a massive, massive amount of money and time spent on preserving his words for all time, right? And and this was the this was the thing I think that compelled him to do this film project in the first place was how do I get people to see and hear me more? <laughs> this will do it, right? And for and forever to to put it into a form, a medium that will be of the future that will always last and in 19, you know, in this time period uh, film was that medium, so I so I, I really see those roots in this in what he's saying here. Yeah. You know? All right. Oh, now we have a part two. Okay, let's carry on. We're twelve minutes into a nineteen. We have nineteen to go. Oh, these transitions are <laughs> fucking awesome. <laughs> Oh, like I said, I did not preview this first, so this is just how it was uh, on, here we go, uh, on, on video. Now, this is a graphic, this is a graphic representation, and we see here... Oh, is that what we're going to get now, a graphic representation? Graphic. Now, here is okay. our okay. 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 friend, the ARC Triangle. There Here's it is. A... Here's R. Also, here's can I just C. pause so, very yeah, quickly? Yeah. Sorry. So, my understanding of ARC triangles and KRC is that it's an equilateral triangle, right? They're all equidistant and they all move together. Whereas he's very clearly just drawn a triangle that's not like there is clearly more R and C in this ARC triangle than there is A. Like the whole yes. point is that they move and grow together, but his graphical representation. <laughs> No, it's his not. graphic his graphical representation leaves all kinds of things to be desired here. Uh, <laughs> no question about that. Um, and it is supposed to be a triangle, and they all do move at the same time. I'm just I've got this little earwig in my in my head right now, going yes, but Hubbard did say it's not really an equilateral triangle. The the C is supposed to be higher. Well, here the right. here the C and the R yeah. are equal, but he screws it up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you take any corner of this particular triangle, if you take any corner of this triangle and raise it, you raise the other two sides. The triangle. For instance, if you raise the raised communication, Can you will know also improve his affinity, you will also improve his reality. If mm-hmm. you would raise somebody's reality, you will also improve up, uh, his affinity and his communication. Now, this triangle then rises uh, as you see it, so that we have somebody down here with little a and very small r and very small c. I see. 
And if we raise the R, we'll find the A and C come up, so we get a slightly larger R and a slightly larger A oh, and this a slightly is larger graphical C. Representation and then having raised the R here and raised it here, perhaps now we raise the affinity of the person up to here, and we have raised the whole livingness of the person. Now this in action... We have raised the whole livingness of the person. And yet all three graphical representations look exactly the same. The right. R's are all the same size. There's one A that's slightly smaller, but the triangles look identical. That's right. Like, oh. It's the same as that coffee. stupid... Well, this is actually just a reproduction of that stupid graphic representation uh, from the science of survival. I mean, this goes back. This triangle on top of a triangle on top of a triangle thing is, is, is like 12 years old at this point. Um, and it didn't communicate the first time. I mean, if he was trying to create like small triangle and it goes bigger, anyway, it's very frustrating. He's drawn three triangles exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, this is Hubbard, man. I, I you, you wonder now, I have to wonder now if he was so blind or, or uh, you know, nearsighted or whatever that he actually literally couldn't see it. Because he hid that from people. He was, he had nearsightedness and he would refuse to wear glasses around people or, or let people know that. Wow. Oh. The fact is a picture of life. Life is composed of affinity, reality, and communication. There it is. See, it's those little I, these I, little drops, you know. I thought I thought ARC was understanding, not life. The life was the dynamics, and even if I don't know when he came up with the eight dynamics, but in Dianetics it was the four dynamics, right? So yeah. life was the dynamics, not ARC. ARC is understanding, so he's contradicting here. Well, well even worse. <laughs> ARC equals understanding equals life equals the dynamics equals A equals A equals A. <laughs> <laughs> Total inside joke there, guys. Total oh, Scientology joke. joke there. All right, let's carry. Those in the ch Theta Novus will find that funny. And any yes. other Scientologists yes. in the chat. Okay, let's <laughs> carry on here. This is also what is known as graphic uh, representation, and it oh, gives is us it? a good How many picture. times did you tell me that, Ron? I, I told you he loves that term, graphic from representation. from one mind to another. I, honestly, I'm not even kidding right now. I think he <laughs> thinks it makes him sound smarter. I think that's it's like he just learned it. that new word for yeah. the first time yesterday and he's like oh i'm gonna use that yeah it's like oh that sounds so scientific let me use it <laughs> i'll beguile these 1963 you know <laughs> oh boy oh boy okay now you have seen the straight <laughs> lecture and you've seen graphic representation and there are yeah. also other means by which visual <laughs> education can be accomplished. Oh, really? Now this, of course, oh, is three-dimensional, three-dimensional representation. And oh, here we you. have something that could be called a GPM. Can you, can you put a light on it? Uh, this is not necessarily Maybe accurate, it? but it's simply amusing. We have a GPM, it's three-dimensional, it's representation. And we take the line and we get the RIs coming out of this. And that is graphic representation. Now, <laughs> graphic representation. There's another oh. one of these, probably much more important to Scientology, which is the auditing demonstration. Now, auditing can be done in thousands of different ways. If you don't believe it, watch students here and there trying to audit without proper instruction. And of course, they do not get the results when they audit poorly. So one of the most important parts of this is auditing. And we will now show you a short auditing demonstration. Oh boy. Okay, Chris, They're actually are you ready for a, this? A demo? Remember, right, yeah. this is supposed to be LRH, so this is pure. This is the best type of auditing you oh. can ever get. There is, It's going to be flubless, right, because it's LRH. <laughs> this is pure. This is perfect in every way. Also note, I want to draw, draw your attention to the whole hypnosis thing, right? Like the similarities between hypnosis and 
LRH and Scientology. It couldn't be clearer. That's all I'll say before we get into it. But flubless auditing session. Yes. Oh, I've, I've, I've been waiting for this. I, I heard this was in here. I can't wait to see this. All right, here we go. Let's go. All right. Your chair's all right. Yes. Is it all right if we audit in this room? Yes, I think so. All right. Very oh. good. <laughs> uh, squeeze the cans. All right. Thank you. Let's oh, do that again. No. Squeeze the cans. All right. Thank you. Okay. We're just going. I'm going to say straight up right now, I completely picked that all right up from oh, Hubbard right. when I was in. Because oh, there were many right. lectures where he talked like this. Yeah, I use that a lot. Uh, when all I, right. All right. Yeah, that's why Matthew McConaughey cracked me up so hard and dazed and confused with all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I just could not. I lost it the first time I heard that. I run a little bit of having this in this session, and that is it. Yeah, it's interesting. This was a thing. Um, this isn't remarked on anywhere else, so I'll comment on it here, that goal setting was part of auditing back in the day. They don't do that anymore. But it used to be a standard part of the process when you began any session that you'd say, okay, what are your goals for the session? And then at the end of the session, you would check back and see, did you achieve your goals for this session? It was another layer of, of, of the reinforcement. Whereas now you're told your goals this is what the session is for oh yeah in addition to whatever the process is trying to accomplish that's still there at this time but the personal goals thing was um actually dropped later on i don't think it was as effective as hubbard thought it would be at, at the beginning just a comment okay enjoy the session all right very good your goal for the session is to enjoy the session. Yeah, I can see why that okay. didn't work out. Is that it? Yes, all right. Oh. Okay, put down the cans. We have in this process, I believe, is touch that. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to run a few commands of this. All right. Touch that phone. Okay. Touch that sign. Okay. Touch that can. Now, let me say why this is happening. Not the Scientology reason. The Scientology reason is this is called a havingness process. And it's supposed to bring the person more into present time so they're ready for the session. But what you're really seeing here is compliance, right? You're seeing compliance conditioning here. It's, it's I'm going to tell you what to do and you're going to do it. And you're going to do it with a smile on your face. And all while using that droning, repetitive yep. type of voice, which you see in hypnosis. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. It's that like repetition, the tone. It's textbook hypnosis. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And touch your left hand. Good. With your left hand, touch your right hand. Good. Touch your right shoulder. Touch your left shoulder. All right. Touch your table. Okay. Touch that phone. All right. Touch the cans. All right. Pick up the cans. All right. Squeeze the cans. All right. Do that again. Squeeze the cans. In other words, there's been an enormous increase in happiness here. Okay. All right, that was the last command. Now, uh, all right with you. See the fact that he's squeezing the cans a little harder now? That's an enormous <laughs> increase in your happiness. Oh, you're so much better off than you were two minutes ago before I was droning at you. You know, is basically what he's saying there. I end the body of the session. Yes. All right. End of the body of the session. 
Okay. Have you made any part of your goals for this session to get my happiness up? Oh, that's all yes. they're doing is the happiness. Right. Okay. And your second one, enjoy the session. I really did, yes. <laughs> all right, very good. Are there any gains you'd care to mention? Get um, the wins. Get the euphoria. Well, I've come through this, what might have been a, Push it a up. difficult experience, being on cameras and so on, without any worries. I think that's a gain. Oh, Usually right. I'm quite nervous about these things. All right. <laughs> See, that's... Okay. Hilarious. What gains have you received from this short two minutes where I've just told you to touch a load of things? Yep. You know, yep. and he's like, oh, um, well, uh, he obviously couldn't think of anything. And he was like, well, I was nervous with all these cameras and we got through it. So I guess that's a gain. Yeah, How, exactly. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make something out of nothing here. Yeah. Right. It has to be because there has to be something. What gains did you have? Not did you have gains? It's what gains did you have, right? This kind of thing. Well, I, I did it. That was the right. game. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we're almost done now. <laughs> you know? Oh, I remember, I, you know, I, if it wasn't so familiar, <laughs> I mean, I'm telling yeah. you, we had to come up with this stuff sometimes, you know? Very good. Very good. Well, thank you for very much for making your goals in this session. And thank you for making these games in this session. All right. Is there anything you care to ask or say before I end this session? No, thank you. All right. Is it all right with you if I end this session now? Yes. All right. End of session. All right. Tell me I'm no longer auditing you. You're no longer auditing me. All right. Now, what you have just seen has been a demonstration of model session. It uh, was a very good demonstration, and it had in it all the elements that you find today in a model session. This is a model session modernized. Red Sharp was the PC, and you see that it worked because he had an enlarged needle swing on the can squeeze test. That is the selling point for so much of Scientology. The needle moved. The needle changed. Therefore, I have gained, I have experienced something significant and important in my life. I have seen and heard more OTs when I was in and after tell me, well, the meter is what sold me on OT3 because it moved. And why would it move if it wasn't true? Well, because you can squeeze the fucking can and make it move. Like, there are so many reasons why that needle moves that have nothing to do with Xenu. But that point right there of Hubbard saying that, that is such a core part of Scientology indoctrination. If the needle moves, it's significant. Now, let me ask you, Chris, this, because yeah. obviously I wasn't a trained auditor or anything because I only used the e-meter for stress tests and that sort of thing. Um with your training and knowledge of how an auditing session is meant to go, would you say that that was a model flubless auditing session? Oh, God, no. That guy, he, <laughs> Hubbard would get crammed up one side and down the other on that, right? Um, no, not at all. And and to be clear, model, okay, uh, without getting into all technical jargon and everything, model session is is a term that's used for here is the model of how a session is supposed to go. Every session has a step one, step two, step three, step four. This is the model. That's what he means by model there. Just to be... But also, I don't know, LRH, pedantic, like, probably. Yes, it's model, but also LRH is meant to be pure and perfect. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Like, Absolutely. That, that auditing session should be faultless. <laughs> and it was not, not by a long shot was that auditing session <laughs> exactly. flubless. No, no, you're, you're on point. I'm not, I'm not correcting you at all on that. Hubbard is a horrible auditor, but did you notice, and I'm sure you did, the tone of his voice and the volume of his voice and how different it is in the session from outside of the session, how he lowers yeah. it, how it's a smooth jazz kind of voice. It's a very different kind of voice from his regular hypnosis. talking voice, you know, and that's how yeah, Alex nailed hypnosis. it there with that. It's, hello, thank you, touch the cans, thank you, do this, thank you. Yeah. Whereas all the things that I've been in are much more uptone and much more direct and, you know, thank mm -hmm. you, do this, thank you, do this, thank you, you know. That's right. It's much more, 
Yeah. Anyway. Well, it was it's a, it was always a very weird thing for me getting trained or being uh, in Scientology all those years that I could hear him on tape. I could see him in some lectures. And it was always different from what he later put into the tech training films or showed or what we would see videos of as presented to us of what good auditing looked like. It was so much more like what he described auditing to look like and sound like and what it should consist of. And then what he would do in the auditing sessions like you just saw. Because I heard countless numbers of lectures of auditing demonstrations of him doing that exact thing over and over again, right? With different different people in different circumstances. And it was always like that. He would not acknowledge. He would over-acknowledge. And, and every word in an auditing session that an auditor utters is controlled and important. It's not a, it's not a you know, roll your own auditing session. He was very precise in his instructions about how to do this. And it always struck me as weird that he didn't follow his own instructions. Do as I say and not as I do, Chris. Yeah, yes. And even when I talked to other Scientologists about it, because this came up a couple times, they would just, and I would just look at each other and we would just go, well, he's Ron. I guess he can just get away with that or something. Like it would yeah. be that kind of a, huh, yeah, well, I don't get to audit that way, right? And he he must know something that we don't. There must be a reason why he's doing it differently. Right. And yeah. we'll find out when we do the next level. Yeah, exactly. It's just, well, that's just Ron and he just had yeah. his way, you know. So uh, as as nuts as this looks, and I know it looks nuts, I'm, I just want to get across to y'all that, that when we were in, when I was in, we could make any of this make sense. That's what's so terrifying about looking at cults and the psychology of it is anything. This blatant, blubtard guy here was my guru <laughs> yeah. for decades, right? And you just go, yeah. how? You go, because I had some seriously thick rose-colored glasses on. That's why. You know? Yeah. All right, let's let's carry on here. So the situation is today that a session is a very precise activity, is carried forward very calmly and so on. Now this is the type of thing that you can relay on visual education, and this is the type of activity that uh, is best communicated by such things as film and television. There was one television camera uh, pointed straight at the set, uh, the e-meter, and another one was on the session. There could have been a third television camera on the PC and even a fourth one on the auditor. But that was a demonstration of model session. In order to make Scientology work, it is necessary to hold a standard, and this standard must be held very relentlessly. And unless all the actions and all the the various techniques applied can be held to a standard of rendition, then Scientology doesn't work. He is absolutely <laughs> right about that, though. He's absolutely right. He was trying to enforce a standard, get everybody on the same page on it, but what that standard was was a framework of coercive control. And that's why it was so important to him. Because if you just used an e-meter and his commands and his auditing process, and you used it in a humane way without all the hypnotic crap and all the other nonsense and, and, and rigmarole that you would have to do, all these little incantations and having this and goals and all this other crap, all of that is in there for a reason. It's all structured. And it's all per, every element of an auditing session is purposefully there to control the person and i can't stress that enough because it, it's it's missed uh, often right and it took me a lot of research to figure that out uh how he how this fucking guy did it right and it's in his lectures and it's in model session and it's in the structures of this stuff that the control happens no matter who you are or how well intentioned you are to do scientology and help people if you follow his instructions on how to do it 
you are manipulating and controlling people. Period. You can't you can't not do that. Using especially when you bring the e-meter into it. Just want to make that point cuz uh, you know, I think it's important. <laughs> but Absolutely. it's also why it was important to him. He knew what he was doing. As goofy as he looks and as silly as he sounds, he actually did know what he was doing in putting this structure together because it was definitely yeah. premeditated. There's no question it, about it, it. It only works if you do it the way I tell you to because that's how hypnos hypnosis only works if you do it in this sort of way. That's right. This, this brand of hypnosis, this covert, mm. dominating kind, because that's what this is. Right. It's not it has nothing to do with informed consent or anything like that. It's completely devious and underhanded. OK, let's carry on. <laughs> Scientology doesn't work if it's badly done. In other words, the disciplines of Scientology are fully as important as the thoughts or discoveries of Scientology. And it is up to visual education to carry these through. If it were not for the communication media by which we relay the technology to the student and to you, uh, Scientology would just be an idea, and all of its technical developments, tremendous as they are, would not even vaguely uh, arrive or be applied, and they wouldn't work. An auditor is as good as he is trained, and that's as good as he is. An auditor is as good as he conforms to everything I tell him to do. Stop thinking. Follow my orders. You rats. <laughs> That's basically yeah. what he's saying here. I mean, he really drums this stuff in. This is this was this was 1963 and he's st and this was one of the things that actually stayed consistent. See, it's interesting if you look at all the changes in Scientology, it just occurred to me. All these changes constantly changing, but what stayed the same? This line right here. Do what I tell you or it won't work. You know? Control, yeah. Yeah, exactly. He finds Scientology as workable as he applies it in a highly standard way and does not mix it with any other materials. You hear that, Warner Earhart? You hear that? The world of Scientology, though, is not totally a world of research. I do most of that. There are millions of dollars worth of research have been done in Scientology, done by the Ford Foundation. Lord knows what they would have cost. Uh, this is to a what? what He just said the Ford Foundation did millions of dollars of research into Scientology. Millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> I got all the dollars. It's very good. It's the best. It's millions of dollars. Who does that wow. sound like, Chris? Wow. Yeah. Who? Who could that be? Millions and millions. It was huge amounts of dollars. Huge. H the hugest amount of dollars. <laughs> so many dollars. <laughs> Tell me all the dollars. All the dollars. Three out of your view and sight. But that technology uh, has been researched, uh, is witnessed by the fact that technology works. The workability of Scientology establishes how far it will go. And today, even on a PE course, people are doing very marvelous things in giving assists. We teach and should be teaching assists at a PE course level. Just one thing I want to comment on real fast, just as part of the structure of this, is the translation of it works, right? And this whole thing about it working, um, what, he's, what he's saying is it makes you feel good. If you feel good, it's true, it's real, it's correct, it's scientific, it's everything, it's a laundry list of things, as long as you feel good. That's the standard by which you're judging all of this, right? Do you feel also, good after a session? It works. He just... He just talked about assists being taught at a PE course level. I don't remember learning how to do an assist as part of the personal efficiency course. No, it changed. That was one of the many of things course. that changed. <laughs> people are going home and healing other people uh, in a most remarkable way. Uh, I use the word healing there advisedly. But the situation is... Yeah, we're not practicing Scientology, because of its value because of its tremendous workability is the first and only psychotherapy that this planet has ever had has tremendous communication lines they 
Did he just admit to Scientology being psychotherapy? He did. He called it psychotherapy and said it was the first and only psychotherapy this planet has ever had. I but mean, it's not you know. psychotherapy. Well, he says that in other <laughs> places. Is. No, he never contradicted himself. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, he never did that. Stop saying he did. <laughs> he never said it wasn't psychotherapy. He never said that. It's not psych. It's a applied religious philosophy, but it's not healing. But it is. But yeah. it's not psychotherapy. But it is. It's yeah. not hypnotism. But it is. Shh. He <laughs> never contradicted himself ever. <laughs> Sun never sets on Scientology, and the communication lines cause a tremendous amount of admin. I wonder if that's where this came from. The sun never sets on Scientology. That was a pretty famous thing we were, we would say in the 80s yeah. and 90s about Scientology. Was that still a thing with you guys? Yeah, yeah. Sun yeah. never sets on Scientology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I wonder if this is the first place he said it. I, I don't remember reading it before this. Administration with tremendous staffs and so on at work. They're very good people. They're very decent people, and they do a very, very good job. We want to show you some of that end of it as it looks down from St. Hill. This is a small portion of the oh. communication center at St. Hill, oh. which handles the communications of Scientology throughout the world. This is the telex printer in the communication room at St. Hill, and here is Peter Hemery watching an incoming telex. Cutting edge technology. There's a telex, guys. If any of you are ever wondering what a telex actually looks like, there it is. Let me talk about some archaic technology. There it is. I never saw it in action. Well, are you ready wow. for this next shot now, Ron? Also, yeah. um, just by while we're talking about Peter Emery, um, I'm pretty sure Peter Emery was declared an SP. <laughs> oh, I think I think everybody in this thing has been declared. I, 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 Reg, I think, was too. Yeah. Mary Sue wasn't, but she got kicked to the curb. Pretty much the same and, thing. And, and Peter Emery here is described as like a close aide and a friend yeah. of Hubbard's and how he's been mm -hmm. really good at helping. Like, well, mm -hmm. Hubbard clearly had issues spotting SPs. Oh, you think? Kind of like Miscavige. It's a bit contagious that way. <laughs> Their inner circle always end up being SPs before too long, and then new people come have to come into the inner circle. It is a consistent, it, it's actually pretty much a sign with somebody, right? If they're, if, if they are a, a littered, a, a trail of littered relationships behind them, right? And L. Ron Hubbard was the king of that, the king of it. Ah, oh, and Miscavige is no different. Yes, yes. Oh, just, just a minute. Just a minute. I see the kids over here, ready to say good night. Excuse oh, me, just a moment. Oh. oh my God! Good Come, night, children. Daddy. Good night, Diana. Good night, Clinton. Good night, you, Daddy. Good night, Suzette. Good night, Daddy. Good night, Arthur. Have a good Thank snoozle, you. huh? Thank you, Daddy. All right. You heard the telex running there a little while ago. That's probably the most time Hubbard spent with his kids that entire year, by the way. Just such saying. bad acting. Ah, uh, yeah. Those those kids were adorable. Hubbard's such a... I mean, knowing what you know about Hubbard, right? Yeah, seriously. That's pro I'm, I'm not even kidding. That's probably the most time he spent with them that whole year. Guy hated his kids. You know, that telex connects with every Scientology office in the world. The... Uh, Telexes you just saw coming in and so on might be rather important. Here's Peter Henry now with some of that telex traffic. What have you got, Peter? Telexes here, Ron. One from Johannesburg. Oh, here's that shot. Right. I would see this in events Coast every Washington. now and again. This right there, handing Hubbard that thing. That was well, things seem a bit calmer in the United States these something. days. Melbourne. Oh, that's... Look at that. Look at that. They had a very good week last week. Melbourne's coming up there since they got Peter Williams back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. This about this new building out there. Yeah, it looks okay. Tell her, tell her okay on that, huh? Okay. One from London. 
Well, these weren't set okay. up at all. London's oh, new building? Doing all right. Yeah, they just got go that for Scientology it. One program, mm. program in. Well, communication is very important in Scientology, and we're we're very close in very close touch with every office in the world. The sun never sets on Scientology. Yeah, you said And that. actually, if the communication lines of Scientology were added all together, they would reach from here to the moon and back. While administration may take up a great deal of our time and other activities of that nature, but research is really the main center and core of Scientology. Is Ron going to reveal the secrets of his research now? Oh, I can't wait to hear this. Yes, Ron, regale us with the secrets of your research. There have been Pavlovs and Freuds and so forth, and uh, frankly, uh, no real breakthrough on the whole subject of the human mind was accomplished until Dianetics and Scientology, and in that, only very recently, have we completely covered all of the ground and made all of the goals these other chaps have had. Now, uh, we're involved research-wise in very many areas. Right now, why the Scientology One is the thing that's taking most of our attention because we have the other levels thoroughly wrapped up. And John Lawrence, our staff auditor, has been doing quite a bit of work on Scientology One. Let's hear what he has to say about it. See, this was the precursor to the bridge, if I remember right is Hubbard started coming up with this concept of levels for Scientology and and grouping bits of Scientology into these into these uh, buckets or categories of Scientology one, two, three, and I think it went up to four, if I remember right, four or five, which would be like the high level stuff. Scientology zero was your street level stuff. Scientology one would be your beginning class work and that kind of thing, if I remember right. Let's see what he says here. But that was this was this was what evolved into what I believe became the bridge. Now, John, you've been doing some outside raw meat PCs mm. and so forth. I'm trying to help you. What have you been getting there in the way of results? Well, I feel it's most, <coughs> I mean, just for myself, we've been getting some really rewarding results. Uh, real help is really possible for these people. It isn't just Scientologists, it's anyone, even people who haven't been introduced to the subject. Mm. Well, now, what processes have you been doing there? Well, most generally with the uh, uninitiated, so to speak. Uh, we've been running touch assist and uh, the Itzalon has you a lot guys. of results with the Itzalon. It's working very well. Okay. And that's going very well for oh, you. Yes. Well, all right. Well, you just keep going on that, John. You just keep going on that. Thank you. Well, all right. Well, Mary Sue, how are we all coming right. along on level four research? There we go. Very level good. Four. It does take a very well, expertly trained auditor to run goals and GPMs. Huh? The high level stuff. All right. And you wouldn't permit somebody who was not well trained in goals and GPMs to run it, is that right? No, certainly not. All right. Well, that just oh. about completes that was your an afternoon intense interview with Mary Hill. Sue. <laughs> wait a minute. Here's Peter Hemery. Oh, wait. What? Peter's back for more? A few dispatches here, Ron. Sorry it's a bit late, but uh, he really should go out. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. Oh, dear. Well, all right. I guess I'd better get started. Well, actually, I hope Peter Emery doesn't find out, but we can't work all the time here. It's I believe that was Hubbard's best effort at comic relief right there. I think, that I think was that's him what trying was. to show how busy he is with his research and running the organization and look <laughs> at all these things. But, you know, let's not tell Peter, I'm going to go and play the piano now. <laughs> St. Hill, there has to be a little relaxation. I come in with your organ playing, Reg. Not at all badly. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing all right. I wonder if these folks believe we can play an organ at all. Shouldn't think they do. <laughs> well, all right. Well, come around here and let's play them a oh, duet, huh? Okay, this is... All right. All right. All right. Now, you, you take the bass part. Huh? Right. I'll take most of these trebles and the percussion, huh? Okay. All right. Oh. 
Okay. I've heard fans right. of that right. the whole track musician, by the way. One, two, three. Awesome. Is that? I think that's the end. That's it. Well, let's end go. of session. You're right. <laughs> oh my God. All right then. All right. All right. All right. All right. That... How are you feeling after that, Chris? I, I, my needle is floating. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to attest to. <laughs> did that? Did that blow off some charge for you? Oh my God. Oh, all the charge. Uh, yeah, I'm line charging right now. Can't you tell? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm telling you, look at these comments here. Yeah, this is bad. This is wow. I knew it was going to be bad, but wow. Um, we've already talked about the quality control issues. I don't know that we need to beat that dead horse anymore, but holy cow. Um, I, I can see now why they don't show this broadly within Scientology. I mean, a lot of Scientologists don't even know this thing exists. I, don't, I, I didn't for years. And when I first heard about it, I, I tried to see it many times and it was like, nope, 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 you don't get to. Well, it's it's full of SPs. It's promoting the St. Hill Special Briefing course, which doesn't exist anymore. Yep. Um, it's not a flubless auditing session yep. and it's horrifically produced and made. Um, and it's nothing short of a horror movie. <laughs> exactly. It really is. It's really bad. And and it's a horror movie because even Scientologists would be horrified if they saw this. That's completely accurate, right? Like, you get why they would actually assign it to the St. Hill Special Briefing Course is the only place you can see it. Because by then, you are so indoctrinated that you'll accept it. You'll just go, oh, okay. All right, Ron, you know. Doesn't it make you wonder how many more there are of things like this that we've never seen that will never see the light of day? Yes. Yes. Like the manuscript for Excalibur, by the way, that apparently exists. Um, I'm told there's like three copies at the at the international base, the archives of this stuff, um, of the Excalibur manuscript. That's, that's to me, that... Um, is sort of the last frontier for Scientology that I that I'm that I would like to get my hands on at some point if I possibly could, is what the hell did Hubbard write in 1938 that was that set all this off? Yeah, tapes are just as bad. Yeah, you guys are definitely uh, tracking with this thing. This is this is horrible. I wish I could say that this was the only time I've seen a film Hubbard produced or directed and, and made that was this bad but all of the beginning films of Scientology were this bad they were in color rather than black and white but they were just as awful um you see yeah. what I find really interesting as well is like the the difference some the experience someone will have who was raised in Scientology or who was in Scientology around this sort of time to now like for me, all of these flashy Super Bowl ads and everything that we see in this amazing stuff, I was told that all of that stuff that we see was all written by L. Ron Hubbard and the, the gold crew and SMP are all just making the films that Hubbard produced. And he said to make it like this. Now, Mitch Brisker has confirmed that that's not quite true. There yeah. are some things like the training films were written by Hubbard. But nonetheless, all the flashy, amazing stuff that we see today people who join Scientology or who um, are younger, like myself, we think of Hubbard as like even what we did at the time, thought of him as even better because we associated that commercial, all of that flashy stuff. That's what Hubbard wanted to create. Yep. Not this stuff. That's right. <laughs> That's right. In fact, you're reminding me right now of something I haven't thought about in a long time. When I was in, I actually wrote one time and asked for the scripts. 
because wow. I wanted to see what Hubbard had written versus what I was seeing on the films. This was my KSW, right? This was my attempt yeah. to, you know, well, what did Hubbard actually write? I'd like to see that. And I got this very pleasant fuck you, basically, right, yeah. uh, in response. Um, yeah, Joe, that Excalibur, I think, is something probably a little different because there has been an independent Scientology effort called Excalibur or having to do with Excalibur or something that is not that book. And I think that's what you're hearing about. If I, I could be wrong, but I think that's what you might have seen or heard something about. I have scoured the Internet looking for Excalibur, and it's and I've never found any evidence that uh, any part of it was ever uploaded uh, or that it's ever leaked out of the church. Um, okay, well, anyway. Uh, yes, I do think that there are copies of Excalibur at the CST locations. Yes, I do. I've been told that there are. Um, that's all I know, though, is somebody who told me that. So, And, uh, and I know um, Jerry Armstrong saw it at one point, but I don't know if he actually read it or not. So that's, that's what I know about that book it's it's a rare property alex i want to go ahead and wrap up today i want to thank you for joining me for this i i like i said i don't usually do these tongue-in-cheek reaction things but this was just too good to not do especially since i hadn't seen it it was just you know such a such an opportunity so thanks for helping me with this do you want to write a success story about the wins and gains you've had from this session oh could i could i could i post <laughs> it up on the bulletin board too and maybe read it at graduation do you want others to what was the wording of it do you I want, want others, others to, to have the knowledge i now have uh, yeah yes absolutely i do <laughs> and i also want others to experience the gains i have experienced yes i want both good <laughs> i'm vgis that's right your, oh. your needle is floating <laughs> all right guys thanks for helping us uh come along thanks for your comments and your support and your feedback I appreciate all of it so much, and uh, and I'm glad that I can bring some value to you, that we could bring some value to your life today. I hope you all find uh, enjoy this on the replay, and uh, let's see. It's Thursday, so we will see you tomorrow night for Critical Conversations. Uh, Alex, when do they see you next? Uh, I don't know. I mean, tomorrow is my East Grinstead Town Council complaints hearing, so I will likely go live tomorrow after that, depending on how it goes. I might go live later this evening. I've got a couple of things up to see, but stay tuned. We'll see. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right, then. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for this, Chris. I appreciate it. You bet, man. See you guys later. Bye-bye.